Dan Green. Thank you so much. Thank you again for coming this morning. I want to thank also Dr. Petey for being here. I know he's on the circuit with the challenges the district is, is facing in space and budget and override. Lots of exciting things happening. So I will um, let Dr. Petey open it up and then we'll have time for questions. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, I usually don't have a problem with that. OK, good. Um, so. Um, so I, I'm a little intimidated by this list of questions. <laughs> but uh, so I said what I'd do is I'd say a few words um, about some of this. I assume we're talking about space for, for the most part this morning. Um, so I thought I'd say a few words about, about all of this, glance back over my shoulder and make sure I've addressed what's up here, and then open it up for your questions for an hour or so, OK? So. Um, the, uh, I guess I want to start where I started with the staff who I spoke with a few minutes ago. Um, I, you know, I think you really need to go to this document. If you haven't seen this document, you, you, I, would, I would say, maybe it's because I wrote it, I would say you need to, right? Because I think it's really helpful. It's, it's on the website. Yeah, it's on the website. It's on our Twitter feed. It's everywhere. It's a um, short-term space, needs and options. We've titled it FY16 through F FY20. And, and what it really lays out, doesn't lay out recommendations, but I hope what it does, um, some people have said so and who have looked at it, is it really shows, I think, the interconnectedness of all of this. So I, I, I have to say, while I, while I know we're going to get into specifics about this school, <coughs> in that discussion, you'll hear me say, well, let me start with what we're, what's happening at Devotion. And some people might be frustrated by that. But that's the way it works, right? There's a connectedness to all of this. I, I said to the staff this morning, I said to someone yesterday, we had a major milestone on Wednesday in that the MSBA approved the devotion project for schematic design, right? $118 million. And someone said, I don't know what that has to do with me. And I said, it has a lot to do with your school because without that, this doesn't happen, that doesn't happen, right? The, the, the pieces need to start falling in place, and, they, and, and there's a terribly uh, intricate uh, interconnectedness to all, to all of this. So um, I'm going to start there. So where we are with doing anything with this document right now is we're, we're at devotion. And we're at what we're going to do to get to the devotion, the implementation of the new devotion school, which means what we're going to do in terms of moving students off the campus or building the school with students on the campus during the next three years, up through FY19, 2018, 2019, 2019 school year. So our original plan says <coughs> sixth, seventh, and eighth grade go to Old Lincoln. As we've looked at the project, we can build that project with students on campus some number of students on campus, although there are advantages to increasing that number. We started out with 6th, 7th, and 8th, and that's been a good number that we've been working with. If we can move all the students off the campus, what we know is it's a shorter time frame. And it's probably cheaper. Right? I mean, there'll be some cost for the transportation to move those students off, but in terms of the project itself, it's less expensive. And we can do that in part by increasing the number of students that we would move to Old Lincoln. But we can't move them all. And so there aren't great advantages to moving, let's say, as it says in here, two additional grade levels there and leaving K through three. It doesn't pick you up any time. And it probably doesn't save you any money. So we've said far and wide, we're, we continue to look for spaces that are probably not in Brookline that probably are not in this town. They're probably in other places to move students from Devotion to so that we can move all the students off the campus. Um, 
And we continue to do that. That means Boston, yes, that means Boston, yes, that means Newton, yes, that means Watertown, yes, yes, yes. Wherever is reasonable in terms of, of transportation, whatever we think we can make work, wherever we can find facilities that we can make work and provide a quality educational experience we're looking at because of, those, because of what it accomplishes for us. And that has great impact on other pieces of this plan. <coughs> Because if we were to get to that point, and what we've been asked by the school committee to do, because we've been saying the time to make these decisions is now, and I'll go into a little bit of the why on that in a second, we've been asked to come back with our, have we located any of those possibilities by their meeting on December the 4th? Now, we don't have that location now, I'll tell you right now. We have a couple places that we've sort of started to test in the last couple days that have identified themselves to us. But I won't, I don't, I don't know what percentage I would put on in terms of whether they're promising or not right now. So by December 4th, we'll have tested some of that out and, and we'll, we'll give them that information and hopefully we'll make some decisions. If, if, if there was a, a opportunity to move students off the campus, we would, I think we would do it. I would certainly recommend that we do it if it were a reasonable, you know, out of Brookline location. Um, and we would take advantage of being able to move that project along because of things like the high school and whatever that, again, you can read about in here, or I can go into this morning, um, and, and when we run out of time at the high school. So that changes, the, right? That, the interconnectedness of this is assuming that happens, Old Lincoln School is off the table. If you were just assume for a second that that were the case, <coughs> There's no longer any space at Old Lincoln School that's an option to assist you with Baker or with, or with Pierce. Those are off the table. So that's the interconnectedness of, of this. Now, if it's not off the table, then there are other decisions to be made about, about, about what kinds of other options in here around Baker that include things like modulars, that include um, here things like Sperber, that what we do with those. And what we've done in the meantime on those is test those out in terms of cost and those kinds of things. So the Sperber, you know, the Sperber idea probably costs in the neighborhood, and these are very rough figures of 2.5, 2.5, 3 million dollars. If you believe Peter Rowe, it's closer, closer to 3 million dollars because he generally looks at what architects give us and inflates it a bit, which is usually where we end up. Um, and there's a rental cost because we have to find a place for coordinators. We already pay $500,000 a year in rental for early education classes. We know, again, <laughs> go back to this, we know there are more early education classes to be moved out of other locations. Probably, we've estimated that at another $200,000 in rental costs. And then we'd have to lo locate space for this. And, and again, you know, time is of the essence in any of these decisions. <coughs> because you actually can't, you couldn't do the Sperber project unless you identify it fairly soon because it has to get into the town's capital improvement plan. We have to find a place for those coordinators for next year because this would have to occur next year in order to have the space available for 1617, <coughs> which again, if you go back to this document, is when we've identified that we need the space. Make sense? So that's sort of the interconnectedness of, of those. So when people ask me what's the time frame on all of this, you know, if Sean Cronin, the deputy town administrator, were standing here, he'd say, I have a capital improvement plan that I have to put together and I have to get in front of the board of selectmen and it has to include what we're gonna do. And that includes school and town. So Sean would actually say yesterday is when decisions have to be made, right? So we've sort of set this December 4th as Knowing what we know on December 4th about the possibilities around devotion and moving people out, we need to move forward with these decisions on what we're going to do about Baker. Is it Modulars? Is it Old Lincoln? Is Old Lincoln even available? What are we going to do about Pierce? Is it Sperber? Is it Modulars? Is it moving sh classes as is laid out in here, short term to some other buildings? Those are options for those two, those two schools as well, although they're very, very limited very, very limited because, quite frankly, there's no space other places as well. Um, and those things all need, all need to be dealt with, and the short-term plan needs to be laid out. And again, the other thing that's going on at the same time is this idea of the long-term plan. So again, just to clarify, because it has impact here, right? So the long-term plan that was originally laid out and was actually submitted to the MSBA 
school building authority, the state organization that funds some of our building projects. In the devotion case, about 30% of the project. Um, every year asks school districts to identify their next priority. It's called a statement of interest, SOI, you'll hear us say. Um, our SOI is submitted right now on the Driscoll School. We expect an answer on that SOI in January. If we get a positive response to that SOI, then the town will have to decide whether they actually intend to proceed with that project. Right? Do we actually intend to do that project? Because at the same time, we have exploration of a ninth school, an RFP, a request for proposals out there to see whether there are other places in town that we might identify to build a ninth school. So what will that next longer term plan schedule look like? Well, I can't answer that this morning because that RFP is just starting. And I can't speak for town authorities as to whether they would go through with the Driscoll project if the SOI is approved. And that has impact here because, because if you look at our buffer zones, right, and if you look at where students come from, you would actually have to create students for the additional space that you would be building at Driscoll. And you only do that because if you look at the buffer zones, it's pretty clear you don't get them out of the existing buffer zones. There aren't enough of them. So you would actually have to create additional capacity by redrawing some of those. And yes, of course, this being such a large school, it would have impact here in terms of longer term, right, students in the future, future students at certain addresses, depending on how those buffer zones were drawn, being moved here and alleviating the space concerns here. Does that make sense? So how's that for a convoluted explanation of, 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 of where we are? So, so that's, that's where we are. So the short version of that is that in terms of some of these short-term issues, number one, unlike the conversation I'm going to have Monday night at Baker, you actually are OK for next year in our assumption. Number two, oh, yeah, OK is a relative term, I get it. Right, right OK is a rather interesting term. So number two. Something needs to happen next year to be preparing for the following year when we actually right, pick up enough sections, again, under the assumptions we've been using, which we think are good assumptions, um, and, doesn't, and don't allow us to house everyone here. Um, I, you know, I will say, because I'll say it again on Monday night, there are, you know, you begin to get to certain assumptions. There's a, there's a, there's a plan that was drawn up around one school that actually says, you know, let's begin to take all of this space and turn it into classrooms, multi-purpose rooms, libraries, those kinds of things. For me, that's where I draw the line and say no. I, so up here, I saw a line that says, will you recommend? I don't know what I'll recommend, but I'll tell you what I won't recommend, right? I won't recommend cannibalizing 50% of the library at a school to, to convert it to classrooms or, or spaces for literacy and math specialists right, to work and taking away all, all of the office space from our teachers. That I won't recommend. And we're perilously close to that at a number of places. So I, I just want to be really frank. I get the concept of wanting to keep a K-8 together. I get it. Okay? And I also get the importance of the educational program, and there's a certain line in all of that, that that you won't get my recommendation on because it actually steps over the line of giving teachers, teachers the right kinds of spaces to do their work and to educate kids. Okay? And at some places, not necessarily in that Sperber idea, I don't think, right? But in some places, in some concepts, we're there. <coughs> We're there. So how'd I do? That's my preview of my speech for Monday night. How was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, school. Um, so let me see what I didn't, didn't do, right? Um, uh, you know, everywhere, I, every time I go to one of these three schools, Devotion, Baker, Pierce, it starts out with, we're the largest school. <laughs> I don't know who the largest school is today, but I actually think it's Baker. But I don't think that's relevant. Um, how does this impact prayer? Well, 
Yeah, I get, I mean, I think I addressed that. We want to remain at K-8. We want to keep schools as, as, as intact K-8, but not at, not at certain expenses. My view. Pros and cons of redeveloping Sperber for classroom use. Well, I, we said it here, right? So the pros are that, that it allows, we believe, it allows this school to become an, an uncomfortable K-8 through whenever this school's needs are addressed by the longer term plan. Okay, that's what it does, right? What are the cons? You don't have a common spaces to accommodate it, right? You know, I, I, I don't know exactly when lunch starts here. I don't have those memorized at each school, but, but it's, yeah, okay, so, so that's where we are across the district. And it won't make that better, right? It won't make your ability to get students together better. It won't make the common spaces like life. It won't make those. It won't make those things better. And at some point, there's a line in that, right? So that's the dis. I mean, those are the main advantage and disadvantage for for those. Um, uh, so. The, we, uh, can I go to the budget thing? So, so I, I think you just have to understand how budget works, right? So is it in my budget? No, first of all, it's not in my budget to begin with. It's in the capital improvement budget. It's in what's called the CIP, right? Which identifies school projects and town projects, right? So it's not, no, it's not in, not in my budget, right? Renovation to X to create Y is not in my budget. It's in the town's budget. Now, how does, how does something get there, I think, is really the question, right? Well, it gets there through work that we do, Peter Rowe, many of you know, uh, and I do, with Sean Cronin, who's the deputy town administrator, and Mel Kleckner, who's the town administrator. School committee has to approve what goes in there that has to do with schools, right? And then the board of selectmen have to approve the CIP, and ultimately the CIP is approved at town meeting. So it has to be approved by the advisory committee, it has to be approved by the board of selectmen, right? It has to go through all those steps and it ultimately gets approved at town meeting. So, you know, there will be items, many items from this document, from these choices, that will be in the CIP. Because as I said earlier, what Mr. Cronin is asking us now is what am I putting in the CIP to address these issues? You've laid out some options, now tell me which ones. Tell me what we're doing. And that will be the conversation, has to be over the next month. You really can't go beyond that in terms of that CIP. I suppose there are ways that it can, but I just don't think that practically it can. <coughs> so that, that's the budget that it goes in, if that's helpful. Um, Beyond Sperber, are there any other options for Pierce right now that would allow? Well, th there, are, there are other pieces within that. I'm, I'm absolutely the wrong person to explain them. I think Piper can explain them much better than I can. But Peter, Rowe, Charlie Simmons from the building department, they've been looking at reconfiguration of other spaces. I think the guidance area and others that would create classrooms and, and spaces that would al that, that all figure into what I said earlier. What I said earlier is the real point, though, right? This, this, this grouping of options create essentially a not so great configuration of K through eight, five sections that get us, again, under the assumptions we're working with now, but every time we create some assumptions about the number of kids that are coming, it increases, um, that would allow that to continue through whatever a, a, a long term is. And I, I just want, can I just, I just want to be really honest about that. Because I think it's really important. I mean, when you start to play this all out, a devotion project, an RFP for a ninth school, a Driscoll SOI that's in, and a high school project, the long-term, any long-term project beyond those things, unless Pierce is somehow identified in those things, I mean, we've now targeted, even in here, that that high school project is finished, maybe, if our timelines are good and tight, around 2021, 2022. You're not looking at any other projects, in my view, before that. Okay, so I, you know, 
I just want to get that out there, right? That, that yeah, so, so we have devotion that's going to be finished, again, under the timelines have been laid out, and students moving back in in 2019. We have a high school project to do. We have an RFP out to look at this ninth school idea, which now people are saying most, most of the, element, the elementary ideas come beyond the high school, right? So the high school, again, in our best estimates, doesn't start start in terms of a shovel going in the ground, not in terms of planning, but a shovel going in the ground before 2019. Again, these are very rough estimates, which means it's 2021 till you're doing anything else. Anything else. So, but it's, uh, it doesn't mean that the freedom uh, the school is not doing anything? No, it means long term. I'm talking about the long term, build a new building, renovate a new, renovate a building. So, no, short terms here. Yeah. Right, okay, so let me, let me try to do a couple of these and then open it up. Uh, when does the decision about moving ahead with Sperber, uh, again, in that, in that capital improvement plan set of recommendations um, that the school committee is going to be taking up, again, that we believe has to happen in the next month. That's when it gets dealt with. Um, what, can the peer, what can the Pierce community do to get Sperber funded? So I'm, I'm, I want to answer this, and that, that sort of is an override question a little later on. What can we do to make sure the 100% model gets funded? Um, so, my view, show up. My view. I mean, it's what I've watched over the last two years with B-Space and whatever, it's show up, right? It's, it's, it's um, show up as the school committee, as we're deliberating um, issues like, um, like the recommendations off of this short-term needs and options. It's show up as the board of selectmen are deliberating what the override question will be, which they're doing essentially every Tuesday night in their meeting in one form or another now, and I get that's a commitment, but that's what I've watched through, you know, B-Space starting with different colored t-shirts with all, you know, mm -hmm. with all Duke candor, Sperber right? Yeah. Pardon? Sperber shirt. <laughs> God, I didn't say that. <laughs> you did. And it's on tape. <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, so that, you know, I mean, that, that, I mean, I'm trying, what I'm trying to t tell you is where those decisions get made and then where they get deliberated beyond that. I've walked you through here how the CIP is put together, right? The school related projects start with this discussion that we're having with the school committee off of this document. The board of selectmen, the advisory committee, and then town meeting must approve that CIP. Right? The override question, there's only one body in this town that is authorized to create an override question. That's the Board of Selectmen. They have a report from an override study committee, right? But they devise the question. Tuesday nights, when they meet, they're considering different aspects of that question. But by mid-January, they'll be devising a question that goes on the ballot for May. How do I influence what goes into that question? Show up. They have public comment, right? They'll have a public hearing on the question. That's how. Um, um, I can't speak to other plans. Um, I, you know, because I know because many of them are embedded. I'm, I'm trying to cop out on this, but many of those things are embedded within other lines in the capital improvement plan. So we have a budget for X, painting. It's a terrible example, but I'll use it, right? We have a budget for X within the capital improvement plan. And on a yearly basis, Charlie Simmons works with each of the principals, right, and, and my staff to identify what we're going to do with those dollars. So if there were other improve, improvements, not creations of space, other improvements to be made short term, they, they, would, they would be developed in that way, right? They're developed between Charlie and Peter and, and your principal. Okay, so that's how, that's how all of those kinds of things occur. And, you know, the good news is there's one less school that we're spending those dollars on right now. We're not spending them at Peter, or at, the, at Devotion, right? Because we're going to be renovating it, so we're not investing those kind of dollars there. You get that. Um, Changes at the high school. I don't understand question seven, but let me talk about the high school for a seven, second, okay? I don't understand the question, but I'll, I'll see if I can 
duck it in this way. I mean, answer it this way. <laughs> um, so um, here's what I've said. If, and it's, it's I've said it here. If we don't, if we don't have additional space for our high school by, and I'm going to use Hal Mason as the assistant headmaster, who I love. Um, he and I argue about this timeline all the time. I say 2020, he says 2019. I'm going to use his date, okay? If we don't have additional space by 2019, and I'm talking about beyond our ability to move things out of the high school. So over the next number of years, we are moving out the alumni room. We are moving out the early education classes. We are moving out adult education. We are moving out a, a, a program that we operate with the EDCO Collaborative, a um, special education program. Those are all go. So that we pick up, I think it's somewhere in there, 10 additional classrooms. Okay? Beyond that, if we don't have additional space by 2019, things get tough. Meaning, we don't actually believe that in terms of doing things the way we do them now, that it works. That's what we believe. And we've looked at those schedules pretty closely to, to do that. Um, so, it's one of the reasons we, we work, we've worked at Solutions to try to make Old Lincoln School available by that time frame, because that has always been targeted as our additional space. So let me use this opportunity to, to, again, kill off one story that's out there. They're going to turn it into the ninth grade campus again. <laughs> We're actually not going to turn it into the ninth grade campus again, because the ninth graders by that year don't fit into the Old Lincoln School. So it would be something, people say to me, what would it be? I say, I have no idea. It would be classrooms for the high school. Yeah, it's a little for, far away to call it the fourth building on the high school campus, but just bear, play with me for a while, okay, right? So that, that, that's, what it, that's what it is. But it's space, and it, it, and it keeps us from having to do certain other things. Now, so let's suppose for a second it's not available, because this all gets stretched out to the point devotion falls behind. Some of these other scenarios happen. We have to move Baker. We have to move Pierce, right? So then we have to look at other options on the high school campus. And, and I, I want to be really clear, because I've said this a number of times, and it's now gotten sort of characterized as I knew it would, I predicted it would, as Lupini's plan. So it's not Lupini's plan. It's an option. So there are many options. One option is, I'll give you a couple other options. One option is increase class sizes. Another option is start, stop running certain electives. A third option is, I'm sorry? A third option is, a third, a third option is, so I, you know, the headmaster, and I put the headmaster in touch with the high school, is, is what's called double sessions. And there are many models of double sessions. Let me tell you one. So there's a high school right now in Washington State, a colleague of mine, where their, high, their, their district waited too long to realize they needed to build another high school. So not like then it dawned upon them that they needed this other high school. And now they're in process. And they're actually building it. But it was too late. And so their enrollment went to the point where it was too late. So what they do now for two years, for two years, they're running a schedule. And this is one form of, of a modified schedule, right? One form, one form only. What they do now is they start school at 7 a.m., they end school at 5 p.m., they run 11 periods, they had, to, they had to work with their teachers to figure out, you know, who teaches when, because people don't teach 7 to 5, so they had to increase staff to do that, and they schedule 80% of their students for each period, right? So that's how they, that's how they that's how they controlled their enrollment to 80%. <laughs> they only schedule 80% of them at any, every given time. Now for them, she'll tell you, the superintendent, that it's working. She also says it's working because everybody knows it's two years <laughs> and everybody's being really nice, right, about it and making it, and making it work for two, two years, right? So that's, what, that's one district, that's what they're doing. I have another colleague, they, they, did, set, they did schedule that went eight to one and one to seven. 
really honest to goodness split sessions. Right? My only point in all of that, all of that detail, right, is that if you run out of space, you will do one of these or more or some combination of them. If you run out of space at the high school and you don't have additional space, you pick the year. If you don't like 2019, pick a different one. We know it's coming. All you have to do is look at the charts of where our enrollment is going and when they're out, what years they're moving to the high school. There's some year in there you will have to change the way you do business if you don't have additional space. So that's how it impacts kids from all over town. That's how it impacts in that way. And again, I think it's a different conversation if you know that the ultimate solution has been identified and it's going to be implemented by 2021 than if you're sitting here now saying, I wonder what that solution is. Because right now that feels really tough, right? OK, let me see if there's a, how can you advocate for the 100% funded option that I told you. Um, are you support? Um, I, I, I don't know what number two means. I'm sorry. I, 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 so I, can I, can I yeah, a sure. Bit? So um, of course you know the council partnership and the way that they split the budget. But my understanding is in the past that's, a, that's about 15 years old. And in the past the schools could advocate for a larger part of the budget every year. Right. So how so how do we? Is there any way to change the override so the override is not about just the schools that we're funding the schools out of the regular budget and the override actually covers a broader swath of town needs. Sure. Supportive of that. Um, sure. Yeah. So let me. Um, so um, let me let me say this and see if this gets anywhere near addressing what you're asking. I mean, Pete. So I was asked at the last meeting. I'll get around to your question. Okay. I was asked the last time I was in front of the board of selectmen, what does a no override budget look like? And. I like to answer questions with questions. So I said, well, tell me how much of that no override scenario the town bears. Because surely you're not telling me that the schools will bear the entire shortfall, right? Right. So we're in the process now of figuring out what that would look like, right, through the, through the town school partnership conversation, right? How much would how much of the shortfall to get to where we're trying to get with the, with the, with the town take on. And, and so I think these other conversations are the same. So let, let, me, let me say it this way. If I don't answer your question, just tell me. So I think these conversations belong within the town school partnership. I, I view the town school partnership more as a way that we create a starting point and then we have a conversation about needs, right? I've been in towns that don't have, towns and cities that don't have that kind of arrangement and the way they create budgets, I would characterize as free-for-alls. I'm not interested in free-for-all, right? So I'm much more interested in a conversation off of some kind of formula that says, well, that's a good starting point, but we have these extraordinary needs, right? We have an extraordinary need around technology that we're trying to put in, into place. We have an extraordinary need around the, the catch-up items of, of, that we haven't funded during all these years. So let's figure out how that factors in. We have an extraordinary need in terms of rental. Should we be, should we be, should it be assumed in the future that we're picking up all of that rental? Should it be assumed in the future that there is an enrollment component, a kicker, put into the town school formula for extraordinary enrollment? That all occurs within the town school partnership conversation. Now, to, your, to, to the bigger point, you said it. It's been in place for some number of years. I guess it's 15. I think it's actually longer than that. Um, I think it's in need of a redo. I wouldn't advocate for redoing it in the middle of these discussions we're in now. But I believe that when we're done with all, when we're done with all this, I believe that when we get to the point where we're past the day, right? I, I, let's assume a successful override. I think we need to sit down and talk about how the world has changed since the town school partnership was originally created, what special ed, I mean, it's happening at the state level right now. There's a chapter 70 commission. Chapter 70 is how we get state funding, right? And, and they're, they're, they're holding hearings all over the state because they've realized, guess what? The formulas don't work anymore. They were created 20, 30 years ago. They were great. They really drove, they really drove improvement in schools in Massachusetts, and they don't work anymore. So it's time to sit down and redo them. 
Same thing here, I think. Well, what you just said was that a no, a no, everyone bears the burden of a no, but how do we change the conversation so that everyone benefits from a yes? On the override. I, I, I think that that's, I don't, I mean, I think there's a way to, to turn it into a positive conversation right. instead of just a negative. Right, right. So I think, um, I, w w would we advocate for that? Sure. Have we had some conversations like that with the town administration? Yes. I mean, the Board of Selectmen really ultimately that rests with them. But as a superintendent, are you going to be advocating for positive 100% I'm not going to be advocating, for, I'm not going to be advocating for how they should structure question that, that that's the I'm going to be advocating as I have I'm going to continue to show them the need right and we've we've produced we've produced three different you can call them budget documents if you'd like now so we've produced a document that says here's where we believe we need to be in 2018 here's where we can be within what you called and gave us as a 90 percent scenario we think there are some real significant positive things in that, but there are things we can't do, and we've shown you what they are. And here's what we can do and can't do within the 65% scenario that you've given us. And, and, and yeah, I'll continue to talk to them about those pieces and what I think is important. I think, I think that what we put forward, what we put forward, was as much a values document as anything else saying, Given that you force us to make these kind of choices within certain scenarios, here's what we would choose to do. That was those were values sort of couched within raw numbers that people don't necessarily. There's no human face on a lot of those numbers. There's no human face on the fact that we're putting guidance counselors and literacy specialists and math specialists in buildings. Well, it was like plus two, plus four, minus three. But it didn't say your kid will only see a guidance counselor every three weeks, or your kid never. The children in our town only get to go to the library once every month, or it won't have a library. So I think it was a little bit of, it was more of a policy statement and less of an advocacy statement. That's how I, that, that was how okay. I saw those slides. I don't know if everyone that's else fair. has looked at them. They were, they were long. I but suppose that's fair. I mean, I don't think that's the presentation we made. And I didn't get to see yeah. it in person, but that yeah. was the sort of tone from, other up, than the second slide about. It's up on our website. Yeah, I mean, other than the, uh, the second slide about the engineer, the polar bear. <laughs> okay, let me, let me get into this and then I just want to, uh, is there an update on decision? Well, I said I, o OLS, yes. Um, yeah, I have a principal, you, you may know I have a principal. Um, she's trying to create a program. She'd like to know who's coming to her school. So yes, we'd like to tell her uh, who's coming next year and get on with it. So yes, Dece I, December. December, again, the next marker is December 4th. We have to report to the school committee as to whether there is some possibility, probability, option for us to move all of the devotion students out. That would involve, that would clearly involve using all of the capacity at OLS. And that would end effectively, in my view, unless I'm wrong, I could be wrong, um, that would end the option of any other school being in the OLS conversation and would drive those conversations in, a, in different directions, many of which are laid out in that document. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I need my water. I'm Brian. Go ahead. Hi. Town meeting member. I, just, I wanted to ask a little bit more about Sperber and particularly, you know, just looking up at this thing behind me, you see at the top line it says Pierce 450 kids 2007, 822. And then, you know, I, I've read through this document you're talking about, the one that's sort of listing school by school all the challenges and everything, and it's clear that there are a lot of difficult choices to be made. And my takeaway with respect to Pierce was that Sperber is sort of it, like as a viable option to kind of really make this school continue to work. And there weren't a lot of great alternatives. And so, but if you could talk for a minute about what happens if Sperber is not funded, if we don't expand into the Sperber Center, what it looks like for the Pierce community and for, you know, sort of the future of the kids that are in the Pierce district. Um, so, I, I, I always have to make some assumptions, right? So assuming that I don't have old Lincoln, and assuming, I'm trying to frame your question so I understand what I'm doing here. And, and assuming that then I don't do Sperber, right? Okay. Right, exactly. What are the other options? Right, I think that's Yeah, the, that's they're not good. Um, so, um, I mean, the other options are 
The other options are, and I think we spelled them out, they're, they're modulars, which we haven't tested um, here as, as much as we've tested at other places. I'll be honest about that. We have, it's a much more difficult place in terms of modulars than Baker, where we have a field. I don't love the Baker option either, but, but, but I have space there, right, that I don't have here. So it's, it's an option that would need to be tested. Um, we're in the process of doing that now, not, not necessarily just at this school, but as a general option in a number of places. Um, the, other, the other set of options becomes a little squishier, um, and it involves individual rooms at other schools. And I tried to lay out that example of Driscoll. So, so you could, for example, buy time. And, it, and it's, a, it's a time buying mechanism. You could buy time here. I think I said the, in the <coughs> plan, buy in, um, in, in 17, FY17, when you need that one more room. Right? Next year, remember, we're OK. We need one more room the next year. And I think it's two the year after, and then it goes on from there. You could buy that <coughs> one year by moving a class in some way to, for example, for example, a place where we have a room yet in that year, Driscoll School. What you'd have to do to make that happen is move out their remaining early education class, okay, which we had tried to preserve. We tried to say these remaining schools will have K through eight and one early education class. You'd have to say, not going to do that. But it's not a long-term solution because the next year you need two more rooms here and, and you don't have them. And you don't have a Lincoln to move them to. Now, the, the one other thing that's in the questions, again, you asked, you asked the question. So I'm, I, again, this is not an advocacy, folks. This is just, I was asked a question, play this out. That's what I'm doing, OK? OK, so you know, one of the other questions that's laid out in there is, is you know, what, what, what happens with the space at, the, at, the, uh, at Lincoln School, at the music school, right? We, we, that's our building. That house is our building. And if the music school isn't there, we know that there's at least a classroom there. And we know that there are office spaces there. I can't tell you, because I've never really looked at the data on it, could you turn that into X number of classes? So the example I just gave, let me finish this, and I'll stop right here. The example that I just gave you around Driscoll, you could do the same thing there if you could identify that one class or whatever. But and the only reason I went into that detail on those two things is that's the kind of conversation you'd be having in answering your questions. So, that means that you'd um, be using, and, and by the way, the buffer zones for this school, you know, because you've seen, probably a lot of you've seen the charts that we've shown of the, of the buffer. The buffer zones don't go this way. The buffer zones go that way. Our, the majority of our kids are in Lawrence, Driscoll, Pierce-ish. How's that? Buffers. Right? That's where the majority of kids reside. So neither of the two schools that I just mentioned are you know, the natural kinds of lines. Did that help at all? Right. Well, I guess I just want to make sure people understand that there aren't, like, because I've read through this as well, and it just feels like absent Sperber, we don't, I mean, the Sperber is kind of the only thing on the horizon for Pierce. There's no, like, longer term plan, as you said. And, but if we don't have Sperber, then it just starts to feel like you're moving one classroom of kids, and then are they bust back and forth? Well, that, that, that's, that's what, what I tried to lay out, and all those things yeah, we need exactly. to deal like, with. Like we need to figure out a way to make sure that happens. So but let me be real. All, I just want everybody to let me to let me just be really that. clear, right? So I artificially um, manipulated. Some people would say your question, right? I started with an assumption that Old Lincoln School was off the table, right? I did that in the, my answer. If you go back and you say, well, if that's <coughs> not the case. Then there are other options laid out in the plan. So what does the old Lincoln scenario look like? For this? Is it that for three years, seventh and eighth, you go to old Lincoln, and then at the end of that time, Pierce would be redistricted, and a lot of our kids would go to the renovated, extended devotion, to the new devotion? Or 
Because it, because it, you're good. Because if you, if you send Pierce kids to Old Lincoln, short term, it begs the question of what happens long term. So, so yeah. it's a great question. Thank you. So, um, the the problem, and again, another example of how these things all hang together, right? The problem with a Baker or Pierce scenario at Old Lincoln is I can't stand here and tell you the end date. I can't. I'd be lying to you. Okay? I can't tell you the end date because devotion isn't creating that kind of capacity. It's a five-section school now using the buffer zones in the way I use them now. So I'm not, when you say you, this capacity, you drive more, more of what, right? So I, 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 would, I, I wouldn't be, be honest with you. So right, in either of those scenarios, I can't tell you it's two years, three years. I can't tell you that. And again, from a district perspective, because I know I have people here, because I saw them up here who want to talk about the high school as well, the other thing that that does is it eliminates my ability to have that 20. So it has, a, it, has, it has all those disadvantages. Now, you know, it has advantages. I believe, so, uh, you know, uh, where you won't, where you won't move me is on this idea of a program, right? Um, I've seen the work that Monica is doing. Um, uh, and I, I believe that we have uh, really quality experience. People who've come to meetings have heard me say, I've already had people come to me and say, my child doesn't go to a school that, um, that is factored into any of the conversation about what you all are working on over there. Are you going to allow other people to, to, to come in? And we've said, if our recommendation to the school committee will be that if there are seats, absolutely. We will, but so so you know. And again, go back to what I said earlier. And again, I'm not arguing the point. Again, our first priority is K to eight. But I but as I said, there are certain scenarios under which the K to eight, you know, you compromise too many other things in terms of teachers' ability to work, teachers having spaces to work. Where I have to say enough is enough. And and in a couple of places, and I said earlier, not peers. In a couple of places, I'm there. You were at a public meeting the other night that we had at Capitol. You heard my explanation on one of those. Yes. Two things. One, in the terms of the devotion situation, you do have a lot of building going on, more housing being created by Avon Street. So you're looking at a growth population there. So I don't know how Pierce kids would ever move into devotion. Yeah, well, I, is I, the I, number going to be the, greater the, there? Well, I don't, know, I don't know, but what I know, I, what I know is I don't have to ask, actually answer that right now because I know that right now they can't. Right. So. Exactly. So that's just sort of, but that's down the road. That's uh, yes, it is. Thanks for reminding me. So the other, well, the other thing I wanted to ask, it seems to me in my memory bank there had been at one time a conversation about using the town hall for classrooms. Would it be a little easier for staff at the town hall, I don't know what the numbers are, to go to the old Lincoln and then have the PSUs go into something? So, uh, to so actually, you know, back of the envelope, because I've, I've heard many of these ideas yeah. here, and I do leave these meetings and actually go to people like Charlie Simmons and whatever and say, hey, just we ought to, even if it's back of the envelope, yeah. take a look. Um, even a back of the envelope analysis, the answer is no. Um, and, um, and actually, you're trading off old Lincoln for that, and I actually don't have that choice. I need the old Lincoln and, not or. OK? Yes? Um, you mentioned the Jocada Music School. Is there a thought to move the Sperber classrooms there? If that's something you guys already have access to? Sperber yes, yeah, sorry. The so um, let me just say this to stay out of trouble. Since I'm on tape. Uh, <laughs> there, there is, so there's, there's this, uh, first of all, there, there's not enough office room there to accommodate all. So that, that could not alleviate, we don't believe under any scenario we've looked at, that could not alleviate the need to rent more space. But yes, there's, there's office space that could reduce that under certain circumstances. The building has other issues. We all, every time we look at a building we control or don't control, we have to worry about handicap accessibility, all those kinds of issues. And the building has those issues. Yes, sir? Could we have a question repeat? Oh, sorry, happy to. Sorry about that. That question was about whether um, using the music school 
would alleviate the, the need to pay rental out if you moved um, coordinators out of the Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a good question. As you can see from a three slash four section school. Yep. So what so I guess total of Yep, I so um I, I don't know the exact number um of coordinators that are at Sperber. No, it's more than ten. Oh yeah. Number of coordinators at that we'd be looking for spaces at Sperber. No, it's more than ten. It's, it's yeah. Yeah, I but a guess a rough guess is 20, 25 people ish. Um, the rough estimates have said it creates four spaces. Whether, whether again, whether again, again, we're doing this really rough. It's past back of the envelope, but not far much further. Um, it creates offices or spaces that allow other spaces to be converted. At right. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the second one. I, oh no, I got it. So in in that hundred percent document that people have referred to, we've actually laid out a thousand student school. At, um, at a principal and three assistants, three assistants. And I forget what the guidance ratio is, although I believe it was in the neighborhood of one to 350, something like that. I, is that right? How about that? I remember my own document, that's great. Yeah, it's in the neighborhood of one to 350, and those are the national standards. Yes. No, um, it's a cut. What we've done is look at that document. We actually took, we glommed them together, knowing that we have paid eights. We took a look at the elementary standard, the middle standard, and we created our own, which we think is justifiable within, within a, what's, what's a K to eight school. Yes? Uh, two questions. The first being, can you please briefly, I know there's a lot going on here, address number six, which is desperately needed currently. And also, I don't understand with the town school sort of connection how zoning decisions are factoring in to this burgeoning population. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll try. So six, I, 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 it's difficult because again, the, the dollars for the most part that are in the CIP. Can I clarify on this? Yes. Which is there's a larger conversation going on about I wrote this short on library staff. And so oh, that, that's a different that question. Just, okay. I'm not just asking about library. Okay. okay. I mean okay. the facility itself needs some very basic revamping. So again, um, we have dollars within that capital improvement plan that are not so there are dollars in there that are targeted per school. We're going to do X project, it's going to cost this much money. It's going to go out over these three to five years. Then we have dollars in there around general renovation, general painting, general yeah, whatever. Exactly. And those are done with principals on a yearly basis in terms of those budgets with Mr. with Mr. Rowe and Mr. Simmons. So that's how that's addressed. In terms of personnel, again, there are some areas that we've done a better job in that longer term plan than others. Our goal in all of this is to try to figure out a way to do some more with libraries, and in particular, keep libraries open later into the afternoon. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And the zoning? Sorry. Uh, oh. <laughs> this is generally where people don't let me get away with it. The question was about zoning and what impact that has and what the conversations are and all those kinds of things. This is where generally people don't let me get away with, look, I'm the superintendent of schools, OK? No, so uh, you know, I, I, I will say, um, and I've said it publicly, I don't think the conversations about planning and schools are as robust in this town as they need to be. Mm -hmm. and, and I've said that to the town administrator uh, any number of times and wherever I'm asked. Um, there are, so I'll give you two, two sets of examples. I don't think that some of the estimates that we get about certain projects and the number of kids that may come from those projects are, are, are examples of, of what, what I would get away with with my school committee. Um, and, uh, and, and I don't think that there's enough consideration when something is proposed as to who the parties at the table should be in discussing what impact that project's gonna have. And that's totally separate 
from whether the town wants to try to create ways of stopping this project or changing the way, right? It, no, it's, it's a matter of a making of sure process. that the appropriate planning yeah. and all. I, I mean, I'll give you an example that, that, that I think we finally remedied, um, finally remedied. Um, certain projects, somebody mentioned one earlier, the number of students' proposals that we get around certain projects say, well, it's going to be minimal because people are just going to be re relocated from other parts of town to there. So let's suppose I believe that, which I do on some level, right? Who's going to replace them in the places they're living now? <laughs> right. And wh how do we account for those numbers? And those numbers generally don't get factored in, and I find that very frustrating. So who is responsible for that? Um, the planning department. Um, the, the, I, I don't know they're posted. The planning board meetings are posted. Okay. So I went to meetings for a while and then I haven't more recently, so I haven't been showing up. And I apologize if I'm asking you to speak to something that I should know because it's been said a lot. But you talked about how a program is being developed at Old Lincoln and there are people asking if there's a chance for their kids to go there. Right. Could you speak? A little bit about what the program might be. Um, it would be, be so. We're going to have Monica present at the. We're we're ready to ramp some of that up, and we've been focused again because of what we know, right? And 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 the speed with which some of this is. Evolved. We've been really focused on devotion seventh and eighth grade because they're going there next year. Um, Monica is going to present. I believe it's in December to the school committee, and then what she and I have talked about and actually are meeting about on December 1st is how to begin to roll some of those things out and come to a PTO coffee or whatever it may be to talk to other schools about what we're looking at. So Monica Crowley will do that and will do far more justice to it than your superintendent. Uh, which one of you wants to go for? I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, you talked about 2021 for the high school, which means there'll be no benefit for the current sixth graders. How do we expedite that so we don't end up in a Washington scenario and say, oh my God, where'd these kids come from? Because you know they're coming. So they're here and we're focused so much on the middle schools and they're gonna be in a construction zone for over half the public school experience. So, so in my view, and I don't, well, I, I was gonna say I don't build buildings, but it seems that that's what I do. Um, so, um, uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't know, I don't know how to expedite it other than I can tell you, and no vote's been taken, but I believe that the statement of interest that will be submitted from the town of Brookline in April, whether the Driscoll project is approved to move forward or not, will be for the high school, right? And that at least gets it on the radar, but remember that in this override slash debt exclusion, there, there, there is no addressing of the high school issue, right? There's no, there's no funding for a project. And certainly the capacity of the CIP, if you listen to Mr. Cronin present, is, is exhausted um, by these projects in, in this time. So, um, you know, the planning, the planning will, I mean, what we need to do, in my view, is whatever we can to make sure that we have additional space available starting in 19 to make Mr. Mason happy. Um, number two, we need to figure out what we're going to do. Is it a second high school? Is it building onto that campus? <coughs> is it another building in some other area of town that's part of the high school but some special program? All these ideas have been thrown out there. They're all good ideas at this point in discussion and then make sure that we meet those timelines. But I, I, I'm afraid that because of funding, as one example, um, and the amount of planning that I know goes into this, that, that, that's the timeline you're looking at. I mean, again, whether that, I, I'm laying it out as a three-year project. That's a guess. Two-year project makes it 2020 instead of 2021. So, but, but I think in 2019, which I know seems a long way off, uh, is, 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 oh good, it's not, because it's not, uh, it's not. Um, is, is, is probably, given those things I just laid out, about the best we can do. And what we need to do is actually make sure we hit those marks. Yes. Can I take you back to something you said before about Absolutely. really focusing on not going over a line for not where we do what we do, but what we do in this building, in all of our buildings. Um, you know, while, while so much of the conversation is around the space, there's still also a content conversation to be had, and you said, you don't want to go too far past compromising what is one of your stated goals, excellence in education here for the Brookline Public Schools. So what metrics are you using for when we cross that line? Is it 
you know, MCAS scores are going down because we're so pressured in the buildings or teachers are feeling burnt out or administrators are beyond their capacity. What, what metrics are you using to kind of keep your eye on that prize? Because we don't want to be in a situation for years from now when we say, we spent so much time talking about the building that we didn't actually realize our kids were not achieving as much as we wanted to. So, and I know it's a stated goal. I know keeping an excellent so, situation um, is a goal. So, um, I, I, I guess I'm going to say thank you for asking me that. Um, um, I, yeah, no, I know I am. Um, so I think I. So um, let me start with let me start with budgets and staffing and those kinds of things. We're there. I mean, I've been criticized for the 65 percent for my response to the 65 percent scenario. Okay, because I cut programs that exist in that scenario, and I funded literacy specialists, guidance counselors, math specialists, and others. Understand something. That's where my recommendations will be, because I actually believe we're there. That's the question. We're there. <laughs> we're there right now. Yes. Okay? Enough, yeah. enough, is enough. Yeah, enough is enough. Enough is enough. So, you know, our, our achievement overall is high. Our achievement has leveled off and our gaps are widening. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's a reason, and it has to do with the things that we've been talking about today. I, I, I stood in front of your staff this morning and thanked them for keeping their eye on the ball when so many of us have had our eye taken off the ball. Right? right. Um, and, and, and I'm worried about that, and I think you know, I, by the way, if I, go, if I went back five or six years and I had the dollars to work with that I was given, I'd make the same decisions I've made. I'd keep teachers in classrooms. I would neglect those other areas, right? And, and I would try to keep those class sizes reasonably small. They've, they've inched up, but I, that's, I would make the same decision again. And, and, and having said that, enough is enough. We're, we've, we've reached that line. And I, by the way, I'm, I can say the same thing about that technology plan. I, I, I said to two principals um, yesterday, I, I, I've been in classrooms seeing really amazing work in first grade, in 12th grade, and everywhere in between just based on the first phase of a technology plan in a district that was so far behind districts that we like to compare ourselves to that it was actually criminal. Um, so that's, that's, I mean, I, you know, is the 65% layout my priority? Sure, and, you know, and I said in front of the school committee, and I'll say it here, I don't like name calling, right? Um, I will say this, um, you know, um, there were some people, so, the, so that group on the override study committee put forward some actual, it was nice of them, they actually told us what we could do with the 65% in addition to telling us the, the money they were gonna give us. Um, and, um, and my priorities in that 65% are clear. They are toward student achievement, our underserved population, and our gaps. My priorities are clear, okay? So were theirs. They cut. They did not fund. Cut's the wrong word. They did not fund those areas. So I could say they neglected those areas. And, and I, dis I, with all due respect, I disagree. And so, and I think there are lots of metrics in terms of culture. I think there are lots of metrics in terms of morale that I don't want to go into here. Um, that, that say, you know, two years plus of this conversation about an override, two years or more about, bill, about a you know, superintendent whose time is largely taken up with budgets and, and buildings is enough. Is enough. Yes, thank you for the question. So given all of what you, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, given all of what you just said and the fact that even the 65% option is a long shot for the override path, 
how can we be entertaining the idea of a nice school? Am I missing something in this budgeting process? Or I wonder how can we ever afford a nice school if we're just struggling to keep up with this? So I, I, so I just understand that I, I can't get involved in whether something's a long shot or not. I actually believe my job is to put forward the right kinds of rationale for good people like you to use in, in selling a question on May 4th. Okay, so right? forget the first part. Okay. How can we afford a nice school? Well, I don't know. How, 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 I mean, how do we afford the, the, the Driscoll? I mean, how do we do, do and, and if, if that's not the case, does Old Lincoln become a permanent school? Oh my gosh, there's deja vu all over again. We're back to B-Space. Um, so I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, but we afford something because clearly the devotion project isn't enough. Right, it doesn't provide enough space. So, do you think the cost of staffing a ninth school is equivalent to the cost of expanding Driscoll or the additional cost in staffing a thousand student devotion? To me, so, to me, it seems like it would be a much bigger cost, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, I don't think it's much bigger. I mean, we've done some, we've done, we've done some analysis because we've had to build it into those budget parameters around uh, what it's going to take beyond moving these seventh and eighth grade teachers over to Old Lincoln? What does it take to run a school beyond that? The budget for that, which is rough, you know, is $700,000 or so, plus what, what's not factored into that are all the heating costs and operating costs and those kinds of things. But it provides a secretary and custodians and those kinds of things. And, and I'm sure that's not completely right. Um, you know, you, you put that up against when is a school large enough, right? So. You know, I'm, I'm fully on board with what we're doing in devotion. I will say that, that you, you've got to do it, you have to do it right, right? So if you look at the plans for devotion, the most recent plans, I am really excited about them. It is an amazing place to go to school. It is potted in great spans. Parents said, make it feel smaller. We get that it has to be a 1,000 kids. Make it feel smaller. We've potted. It in terms of grade spans, K to two, three to five, six to eight. We've potted it in terms of grades. So there are five classrooms here with areas for kids to work outside of the classroom. The ELL specialists, the literacy specialists are embedded in those teams. We've done a lot of work all around the education program. All around the education program. Because other than that, it's just boxes. I can build boxes all day long, right? And they won't serve kids. Right, so, but, but to the point, you, if you have that conversation here, you have to do it right. Because otherwise, you just have, well, what I saw in one place yesterday where it's gotten to the point where there's a first grade up there, there's a third grade over there, because people just, we just created rooms and we've done it over time, right? And we create that kind of scenario. So you have to do it right. Um, so, yeah, you can, you can make, there is, there's a point, I think, where I would, would have said, mm, a little too large. Some people have reminded me that I used to say that about four sections. I did. You were probably here at the forums. Um, so I just said it before you remind me so that you, know, you wouldn't have to. Um, I, I just think you have to, there's a, lot of, there's a lot more planning that goes into that devotion five section per grade level school than necessarily went into when we did Runkle, as an example. Yes, sir. Um, it's my belief that there's only one thing that's going to screw up all the projections everybody's doing. If Boston ends busing and it becomes a viable alternative to Brookline in certain neighborhoods, a lot of the pressure is going to be removed off of Brookline. If that happens, we're going to have a lot of money spent and no kids to be in those classes, if I'm right. Is so, that something people have thought about? Yeah, so um, here's what we've said about what we've done so far, right? So the worst thing that would happen now is if, if we were wrong about projections and, and, and numbers went down. And by the way, there are no projections even in in the worst models that say they're going to go back to 420 to 440 for kindergarten. So the worst thing that could happen, everybody ready, is that we'd actually have space to move our pre-Ks back. Right. However. That would be terrible. But if, that, if, if the assumption I'm making is correct, then instead of spending all this money, why don't we see if we can do something to you know, push them in that direction to end busing so that we don't have to spend all this money? What would we do to push Boston in that well, direction? Well, I mean, A, we can show just through that, A, it's a 40-year-old failed experiment in busing. I mean, if you look at the um, results they've gotten, it's not been good. So they're spending $100 million a year continuing a, an experiment that's not working. 
So, and they're starting to try and make things more neighborhood, more neighborhood. And I think it's probably going to go that way because it's going to be too expensive to upkeep. So if we were to- Well, they have other issues within doing <coughs> that plan, right? Do I know? They have other issues if that's the way they choose to go. I mean, neighborhood well, schools create their own kinds of well, legal problems for Boston. They may. I mean, it, those they problems do. can be overcome too. I'm just saying that we could save $100 million if we can in any way assist them onto that way, do a PR campaign talking about the- How would we do, uh, how would we save $100 million by them doing that? Because we don't have to build all this stuff. Why? About. Because your assumption is what? Your because assumption we, is our enrollment is driven by Boston? Yes. Not yes. entirely. Um, not entirely, but in large part. Because I mean, look, if you look at the number of students used to be in Boston in 1970 versus now, it's a third less. Yes. <laughs> Well, that's a huge amount of empty space that they have there that they're not using. And if they were using it, we wouldn't have such a crowded school. So our problem, they are what's driving our- Yeah, but they're not the only people who are moving here. I understand. Okay. There's a lot, I mean, look, my wife's company has got 500 people gonna be coming in in the next year, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. But Boston's not a viable alternative for them to go to. For most of the people so they're going to come here newton arlington wherever and if boston was a viable alternative then we wouldn't see that extra few students that are going to be coming in that's the point okay i got it all right I, yeah I, don't, I respond beyond what i've said i'm sorry i i do that all the time last, last two doctor <laughs> says i have to go um last two yes clarification sure um could you say that in december we should know whether Seven, eight will go to OLS next year? No. Pierce will not go to OLS next year. Period. Because that was my that was my understanding, but then I thought you were saying they, they, I mean again, again, if you buy our assumptions, right? Right? Our no. Right? Our we we have a plan for next year. Yay. We don't have a plan beyond next year. And many of the scenarios that we've identified have to actually begin next year in order to make them viable for the following year. That's, that's I what that I hope change, I said. So I just wanted to make sure. Okay, yes. Thank you. Uh, I've been a Pierce parent for 15 years, ongoing. I'm sixth grader. What she's asked for Christmas is a set of noise canceling headphones that she can take to school. She's not the only one. The kids are borrowing ones around the school. I love the library building. I love Pierce. It is so noisy. Yeah. It's noisy. Is there any consideration to putting glass partitions so that the noise doesn't bounce around so much? Um, it's just noisy. And how can our kids do optimum learning in a noisy environment? That's a new one. I haven't heard about glass partitions. <laughs> but part of what we're talking about for 1617 is looking at that first floor of the library to make that right. offices that would start chopping up right. that space where sixth graders are right. and making classrooms on that top floor where and guidance. And you could also put partitions on the top floor. So that's one of those under consideration if Thank Sperber you. does work. It would that, be lovely yeah. to have it. Thank you. So that's one creates another. Um, hopefully, I hope that was helpful in any way. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you.